Let's turn the world upside down. Three things you should spend money on. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Brian, I am so excited about this episode because so often we talk about how you should be saving and how you should be investing and where your money should be going and how you should be deferring gratification into the future. But we did want to flip it around. We want to talk about today some things that it probably does make sense for you to spend money on. Yeah, we live in a consumer society. I mean, there's so many voices telling you how to spend your money. Why not have a positive influence to kind of tell you, hey, this is when, this is where, and this is how to do it right. And I love this, Brian, because it seems like the audience wants to know this information. We get comments all the time, like this one from Mark Neal. He said, this episode was great timing for me. I've been feeling super guilty spending money, and I don't do much for fun. I've been imagining myself being old with tons of money, but not knowing how to enjoy it, and it is a sad thing to picture. And I think a lot of financial mutants fall into that camp. I can vis- I can future think about myself having money, but it's really difficult for me to let go of the dollars here and now in the present. Well, there's a fine line between being a financial miser mm-hmm. and a financial mutant. And we want to make sure you have a healthy relationship with your money. So you're not only saving and investing the right way, but you're also spending that money correctly. And so the answer to the question we think is actually relatively simple. I mean, most people want to ask this question. How do I know if it's okay to start spending? And that's a fairly simple, fairly straightforward answer. And then we're going to kind of dive into, okay, well, what are some things that we can spend money on? So, Brian, everyone wants to know, how do I know when it's okay for me to start spending? Yeah, we like to, this is where we've put the math to this. We know that if you actually did the calculations to see what's the gross percentage of what you could save and invest that would give you the best opportunity of having financial independence, especially if you start saving by the time you're 30 mm-hmm. years old, it's right around 25% of your gross income. And a big influence on that is, look, Social Security is kind of iffy. We know pensions no longer exist. It does fall on you to be the one that saves and invests for the future. So we hook you up with that aspirational goal. And what I love about that, Brian, is once you hit that, once you hit that 25%, it begins to free you up. Then you don't have to have that spending guilt. Like what Mark said, you know, I'm doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing. My money is going where it's supposed to be going. It's okay if I spend. So once you get to that 25%, it is okay. So then the next question comes along. Okay. It's okay for me to start, start, to start spending some money. What are some things that are reasonable for me to begin spending money on. So let's break this out into three categories. Number one is things that you use a lot. Yeah, this stands to reason. If there's something in your life that you use often and frequently and uh, really use it a lot, it's probably okay if you spend some money on that. And one of the very first things that we all think about is our long-term home. Yeah, I, I thought about this in terms of people... Often, because we know home purchases are such a big expense. For most people, it's maybe like the biggest yeah. thing you'll ever spend money on. But you're doing it wrong if you, let's just say you have a growing family. and But right now, it's just you and your spouse. If you buy a house that's only big enough for you and your spouse mm-hmm. to comfortably be there, you might be making a mistake mm-hmm. because you're not planning ahead. Because we know this is a long-term yep. decision. You've got to take that into account. So it might require you to spend a little bit more than initially thought. And that's so difficult for us financial mutants. We often recognize, oh man, I could go buy that two bedroom or that three bedroom home and I can spend tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars less on that than going out and buying the four bedroom home. However, if you know that you're just like you said, your family's going to expand, sometimes you have to go against your nature and say, okay, it's all right for me to go a little bit further out on this price spectrum because this is going to be something that I'm going to be utilizing potentially for decades. Yeah, and that's why we can give you a little grace in, in, in several factors. First of all, I think it's okay to do a 30-year mortgage, mm-hmm. especially when you're in that messy middle, because it is going to give you a little more grace on how much you can afford. We also like on that very first home purchase, it's okay if you don't put down 20% on the very first house. All these things are designed to let you buy that house that actually reflects your life. Now, look, we had something 
Um, I, I, I told you about this because engagement rings, things like oh, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. is that I bought an engagement ring for where I thought my wife and I were going. Now, mm-hmm. I didn't fall prey to De Beers advertising of two months gross sure. salary or whatever it was, but I did try to think about it in terms of buying a, a, an engagement ring that my wife would be happy while we're poor, but also the engagement ring that she'd be very comfortable with later with the aspirational success that we were going to have. I would like you to do that with a house mm-hmm. in a very reasonable way in the fact that I do want you to think about, like I said, the kids, where your family's going, how long you're going to be in this area, and use all that to make sure that the housing decision reflects upon where you need to be. Yeah, Brian, what you're describing is you have to know the guardrails. What are the rules that you should have in place so that you know when you do buy the house, you're not getting too far out? And we have just a handful of them. Number one, if you're going to purchase a home, you want to make sure that you plan on being in that area, in that house for at least five to seven years. I mean, I know it certainly seems like right now real estate only moves in one direction, but the Great Recession 2008 taught us that is not the case. And houses in normal markets are not incredibly liquid assets. So you want to make sure that you have a really realistic view of your timeline in that place. Yeah, I also want you to pay attention to what that housing cost is. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the guidelines that we've had for a long time is 25% of your gross income is what housing is. Now, look, that guideline was set up so that you are not house rich and life poor. I know that right now where real estate's running away from us, that 25%, especially if you live in some of these coastal cities Mm -hmm. or high cost of living areas, that could be tough. If you ever do vary from this guardrail, Please know you need to be very fearful because this is to keep your financial life in order because you have a lot of goals not with the financial order of operations, not just housing. We want to make sure you're saving for the future, investing. This is the reason we set up these guidelines. And then, Brian, you already said this. If you're buying your first home, 20% down payment is not a must. Yes, The reason people like to talk about it is it does help you avoid PMI. However, in this housing market, getting to 20% is difficult. So perhaps on your first home, you're only putting down 3%, 5%, 10% so that you can get on the ownership side of the equation. However, when you buy a subsequent home, when you go to move into your upgraded home or your second home or your third home, that's where you don't have any leeway. You do need to put 20% down on any future homes that you upgrade to. All right, Bo, that's primary housing. Let's talk about other type of things that you use a lot Mm -hmm. that you have to spend money on. We want to give you some guidelines. Let's talk about cars and automobiles. Yeah, this is probably a hot take. Uh, We think that automobiles, cars, are something that it makes sense to spend money on. And I think a lot of financial commentators out there would say, no, absolutely not. It's absolutely crazy. You should go out and buy the absolute cheapest clunker piece of junk that you can find for the lowest dollar amount possible because all it has to do is get you from point A to point B, and that's all an automobile should be. Brian, why do we not necessarily think that's the best advice? Now, look, it's true. From a financial on the outside, what's on the brochure, it does make a lot of sense. If we could all just go buy three and four thousand dollar cars, that's great for your ba- your net worth statement, your the way you spend money and budget. Here's the problem with that: there's a good chance if your car's unreliable and you're not a ma- mechanically inclined person. That vehicle, your transportation, could be keeping you away from your biggest asset building ass, you know, opportunity, which is your job. Right. You have to consistently be able to get to work. So we tried to create ground rules that actually allow you to buy a reasonably priced vehicle that will be reliable, consistent, get you to your job, but also not break your financial bank. And Brian, I want to give you credit because this is one of the things you had to mentor me on when I was younger, especially when I started having a family. When I start, you know, got married, started having young kids, you said, Bo, you don't want to just be in the least expensive, lowest priced car you can find. You want something that is going to be reliable for your family. It's also going to have some safety features, some things yeah. in place that keep you protected. So perhaps it does make sense to spend money there. So if you're going to do that, You want to make sure, again, that you stay inside the guardrails. And when it comes to buying a car, we think you should subscribe to our 23-8 rule. And what that means is you got to put 20% down on the car, whether you're buying new or used. 
You cannot finance it for any more than three years or 36 months. And your total car payments across all automobiles that you own cannot exceed more than 8% of your gross monthly income. And then if it's a luxury vehicle, I want you to pay almost same as cash. you got to pay it off within 12 Mm -hmm. months. That's to keep your your big eyes on how much you can afford in check. Uh, Because a lot of people will come to us and say, why in the world do you have three-year financing on here? Why do you treat luxury cars this way if I could get a low interest rate? The reason is because cars, historically, I know right now we've had some skewed things happening. Historically, they're depreciating. They're horrible for your financial life. So we want to keep them in check as much as possible so that you don't try to flex, you don't try to show off in an inappropriate way and to the detriment of your financial life. And that's why the closing rule that I like to share is that your monthly investment Investments. I'm talking about your employer plans. I'm talking about the Roth IRAs. If, the, if you add up all those things and they're not exceeding what your monthly car payment is, you're doing this completely wrong. Yep. So, okay. So, Brian, we've talked a little bit about uh, houses, which are like these big assets. We've talked a little bit about cars, which are these other big assets. Those are maybe two of the most expensive things that we'll spend money on in our lifetimes. However, when you're talking about things that you use a lot, and when we survey the folks who we interact with that have done well and had some success, it's interesting when you think about things that you use a lot, I would also think about things that you are on a lot. And it was kind of pithy. The content team came up with this. They thought about shoes and mattresses because there's this idea, if you're not on one, you're probably on the other. So you may want to make sure you're putting money into those for your long-term well-being. So and, and by the way, on the on the shoes, mm-hmm. this also is influenced by Stop Acting Rich. You yep. know, Dr. Stanley had the book. You know, after he did Millionaire Next Door, he also had this book that was like Stop Acting Rich, actually live like true millionaires do. And one of the things I thought was kind of interesting because there were a few contrarian points is that wealthy people do spend a good. They don't buy the cheapest shoes. Mm-hmm. It's not like they're going out there and buying the the cheapest shoes they can put on their feet. They recognize, hey, if you're putting a lot of mileage on your feet, if you're actually getting a lot of wear and tear, comfort is important to the happiness mm-hmm. and fulfillment of using this money well. So that's why you know Cole Hahn and some other things yep. showed up on that on those surveys. Pay attention to that. There's nothing wrong, I think, if you believe in quality. Because I thought the other part that was interesting with Dr. Stanley is he showed how these shoes would be worn for years. Mm -hmm. So since it was something that was used a lot, but only purchased in a very scarce or so often period, it made sense to do it, focus on the quality and do it right the first time. So you're not buying a bunch of cheap stuff that actually makes you uncomfortable, as well as if you add them all up because of the low quality, you actually spend more this is a good way of thinking about this type of use resource. It's really interesting, Brian, because you talk about one of the things that did not come into the equation was specifically the name brand or the popular brand. It was really more about quality and value. So it's okay to pay more if the increased price is justified by the value that you're receiving for it. If you're just buying expensive shoes for the sake of buying expensive shoes, that is a different thing. We're talking about shoes that actually have some staying power, whether they have medical benefits or just long lasting tenure, it probably makes sense to do that. Now this other one, Brian, is another one that you kind of told me about. I think you said this one day, you're like, Bo, you, you realize when you get married, you and your wife, you're gonna have to make all these decisions. One of the things you have to do is you have to buy a mattress. Yeah. Don't skimp. Could you sleep on a mat? Like if you sleep the average eight hours a night, right? You're spending a lot of time on this thing. Make sure you buy something of quality that is really, really good instead of just buying the cheapest one that you can buy. Well, I think it's also interesting. The first eight years of my marriage, because I was completely a tightwad, um, I bought a queen mattress <laughs> instead of a king mattress. And I wish somebody had said, hey, Brian, you know, with two people on this bed, you know, for just an incremental more money spent, you could get so much more room mm-hmm. and comfort. So it's not always just the brand name. It's also thinking about the sizing right. of that mattress decision. Now, I will tell you there's some disruptions on this front. Absolutely. And the fact there were only a few quality players that were creating the mattresses, now there's all kind of – they've got this new technology where they can roll up these mattresses into boxes. They literally Still can, blows my can mind. mail you – that it is, there's all kind of disruptions in this. So maybe you don't have to spend a fortune 
on the, on the right mattress. But I would tell you, go out there and do the research because you will be spending a lot of hours, literally years of your life on this. So it's a decision you need to do well. All right, Brian, so we talked about houses, we talked about cars, and then I said this statement, you know, you want to think about spending money on the things that you are on. And uh, we were talking about physically on, like shoes and like mattresses. But we also think, and perhaps this is a hot take, you want to spend money on things that you are on, like your cell phone. And I think most of us in this day and age where we live, a lot of us are on our phones all the time. So perhaps if we're using them in that way, it makes sense to make a quote unquote investment in the type of technology that we're using. This one is um, because I think if you talk to my my oldest daughter, she would say, you know, where the a place that young people flex is in the 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 how nice their cell phones are. Okay. Um, and I don't want you going out there and getting yourself in a bunch of debt because maybe there's usually ways to trim the cost down, whether the size of the storage mm-hmm. or other things. But you can end up with good quality phones for reasonable prices. And the reason I do like getting nicer phones is because they do everything now. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you think about it, it's not like a phone is just to connect you on phone calls anymore. It's also your camera. It's your video camera for making memories. So the quality of the cameras now on the new modern phones is pretty incredible. So it makes sense to take advantage of some of those latest tools and, and other things that come with the, these things because that is going to be part of the memory-making process. And I'm always going to give you a little more grace if it's something that helps you build those blossoming memories. I think it's really interesting, Brian. My wife operates a small business, and she has done this for the past couple of years. And she's been able to do it almost exclusively from her phone. So for us, it's very easy for us to justify that we don't get the latest and greatest, newest model every year. But when we start noticing things, like maybe the updates are not not as frequent, or maybe the technology has advanced where it can do something different than it done than it did previously. We kind of tend to think, okay, well, we're using this so much; it's such an impactful part of our social life, but also our financial life. Perhaps it does make sense for this to be something that we spend money on. Now, kind of close out this point. I thought it was interesting. This was put together um, by the content team. Mm-hmm. Little did they know that every one of the phones on this historical display of mobile phones through history, I owned every one of these except for the 1992 one. I mean, literally, and I thought it was interesting, like on that 2000 phone, I have an, I had a Nokia with a cool skin. I didn't even know about this game called Snake. That, it blows my mind, because I actually also owned every... I know we look a lot alike. I'm significantly <laughs> younger than Brian is. And yet, I also had all of these phones except for the 1992. And I said, oh, Brian, yeah, you remember the Nokia? Remember we used to play Snake? And he was like, Snake, what's that? And it blew my mind. Uh, and I think about now the video games that I see people play. We had an intern, you know, this summer playing these like live action walking around video games. On the phone technology has changed over the years, and this was a really interesting nugget. I think it was Daniel that told us this. Both the 2000 phone and the 2021 phone both cost a thousand dollars. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of amazing. And I wish, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I would have shown because we've used it on other shows that that. Radio Shack advertisement Mm -hmm. that had the phones. It had your um, computer. It had all these uh, fax machine. It had all these different things on one page. Everything that was for sale on this Radio Shack advertisement was now packaged in the phones that sit in our pockets. It's kind of incredible. So it is since it is such a powerful tool and resource for you. There's nothing wrong with just making sure you get the quality that lets you maximize your life. All right, Brian. So we've talked about uh, things that you use a lot. It's okay to spend money on those. I think another thing that it probably makes sense for us to spend money on are things that can remove hassle from our lives, things that potentially make living our day-to-day lives a little bit easier. And I think this holds a special place in your heart, right? Well, yeah, I mean, because when we were talking about this, because I want to give context on this one. This is one of those that's important is that, like, when I think about things that remove hassle, we're talking about the washing the car, cutting Mm -hmm. the grass. These are things that you know you have to do, but you don't necessarily want to do because time is money. But I can tell you, look, I cut my grass for decades. And, but as I've gotten to the point, and by the way, it got to be a joke, and I was so glad because we were having a conversation. Because Bo, Bo, we went somewhere. We went to a funeral mm-hmm. this weekend. 
and we you went in comfortable clothes workout down, clothes and, and I said I, we both agreed workout. we were going to dress in comfortable to clothes to go on the car ride down before we dressed in and changed in nice clothes for the funeral and um I wore something that looked very similar yeah, to the video of me and cutting grass. And I, I do cut grass in, in like khakis, which I think is is part of your fun to make fun of me. But it is one of those things where things that remove hassle, like cutting the grass, like you know washing the car. I think it's you have to understand where you are in your life mm-hmm. because if you're young and you have plenty of time, but you don't have much in financial resources. Maybe the value of your time is not to the point that you should outsource this. Mm-hmm. But I think you will notice that all of us hit a transition point, usually when you're you're getting more successful, plus you're also there's more things in life pulling at you between you know your relationships, your kids, and so forth. Pay attention to those things so you know where that transition point is to what the value of your time is. Brian, you have this great saying. You always say in the in the early parts of our lives, in the early parts of our careers, we trade our time for money. But as we build wealth and as we move along through our journey, we actually reach a point that perhaps we can trade some of our money for time. And that's exactly what removing these things allows you to do. It allows you to focus on the things that you and only you can be doing, like spending time with your kids, making memories with your spouse, running your business, actually going out and taking a vacation. If you can remove some of these daily tasks or there's a way for you to outsource it, it frees you up so that you actually can begin to do those things. So let's do it. Let's actually look at a few of these mm-hmm. things because I thought it was great when we put together the research. It said how much time was spent per month, and then what's the actual cost of doing this? So you can kind of get some cost to benefit ratio analysis here. The first service we had was house cleaning. This was a big one, Brian. And, and uh, look, I recognize that this is unique and depends on everyone's cir- circumstance. When my wife and I made the decision that you know she just we're different. We're like we're wired different. Different things matter to us. We take care of things differently. When we recognize that having someone come in and help us keep our house tidy, keep our house clean, it was kind of a game changer in our marriage. Even though it was a financial, uh, a financial responsibility that we took on, the value that we receive from that is invaluable because now we're not having that fight that you said you and your wife always had the fight about who's going to be the one yeah. to do the gross stuff. Yeah, because that's what, I mean, look, I have no problem. I love cleaning dishes. It's okay. weird. I think it's because my parents made me wash dishes. I just think cleaning dishes is very cathartic. My wife doesn't mind doing laundry, mm-hmm. and I don't mind taking the trash out. So it's funny how we lined up nicely on all of our house chores, but cleaning the dookie off the, <laughs> the toilet was just not one that we liked. So we needed to outsource we needed to get some, I didn't mean to say it in a way that it made you uncomfortable, but we should, we, we decided a cleaning service would be best use of money. I love it when I get you. I love it. Oh. Yeah, so think about it. If you, like, on average, the average American spends 24 hours per month cleaning their house. Well, that's that's not incredibly, like, insane, right? It's less than an hour a day, but every day you got to be doing something, whether it's doing the bathrooms, what you referenced, or doing the blinds and dusting and vacuuming and all these things. And so perhaps you've reached a point economically where to get that 24 hours back, it may be worth it for you to spend on average, according to the national study, about $320 a month. So the second one is lawn care. And look at this, 32 hours a month, and it costs you about $252. Mm-hmm. Man, I got to tell you, both of these first two I've seen that's a lot of hours. 24 hours a month, 32 hours a month, and I can replace that with 250 to 320 dollars a month. To me, good cost of benefit. Now, this one is really interesting because Brian, I don't know about you, but when I used to cut my grass, I loved the feeling of it after. When I got done, because I do the lines, you know, of course I'm OCD. I would do the lines, and I would trim, and I would edge, and I would blow off. And it was really, really neat. But here's what it was doing. I was having to do it on Saturdays or Sundays. My yard, because I had all the electric stuff just like you had, was taking like three hours to do. Well, that's three hours that I wasn't with my kids. That's three hours of weekend time that I didn't get back. And I am like grotesquely allergic to every grass and, and, and allergen out there. <laughs> so like I cut and I can't breathe. I'm breaking out in hives. I got to jump in the shower. Again, this is one of those things when I finally just stepped over that threshold and said, okay, I can get someone else to help me with this. My quality of life on the weekend summers went up exponentially. 
So I'm I'm all on board, and I think for everything you just said, these make a lot of sense. When you reach that mm-hmm. threshold, that your time is so valuable because of family commitments and other things, do these things. Yep. This third one was a little more controversial to me, which was grocery delivery, because this says that the commitment is about five hours a month, mm-hmm. and yet it could save you $120. This one I felt like was an assault on my traditional life <laughs> and the fact that my childhood memories, because remember, my dad was laid off in his 40s. There was a lot of poor times there, but there were great family memories where you don't realize you're poor. And one of the great things that I love doing was we load up every Thursday mm-hmm. and go buy groceries. And I don't know if that's because closer to the weekend they did more free samples <laughs> at the end of the aisle caps, but it was it was a great time and I still have great memories that I still like to go to the grocery store with my family mm-hmm. and shop. So maybe that's an oddball thing, but Five hours of benefit for $120 cost, that just the cost of benefit doesn't play for me. But you said it does for your yeah, family. Yeah, c- counterpoint. You know, my wife and I, we talked about that she's going to be the head of grocery operations in our household. Well, we have two young kids that uh, before they were in school, they would be at home. And so she would be responsible of taking the two young kids and load them up and run the grocery store. And literally, it would just be a travesty between running away from her and grabbing stuff off the aisles and throwing things out of the cart and pitching fits and having to go to the bathroom like every 14 and a half seconds. She was like, Bo, this is impossible. This is, it's just, it is so, so, so difficult. How would you feel about us using one of these services where I can sit at my computer while the kids are playing around me? I can order the groceries. We can have them delivered. For us, it made a lot of sense in that season of life. Well, now once the kids are in school and going through that stuff, perhaps we will go back to the grocery store. But I think it's interesting. I think when you were a kid, grocery delivery probably wasn't even an option. I think it's so neat that perhaps these types of things, as we move throughout our life, they change, right? Yeah. Some seasons it might make sense to take to take advantage of these, and some seasons it might not. Or even from a financial perspective, just like you said early on, maybe it doesn't make sense to outsource some of these things. But as the ebbs and flows of our life take place, it is likely to change and adjust through time. Yeah, I mean, your budget still does matter mm-hmm. because I don't want somebody to get the wrong idea when they watch this video and be like, hey, I heard the guys say that it's okay to outsource somebody to go – you know, wash the car, cut the grass, or clean the house, when maybe you have, like I said earlier, a lot of time, idle time, and it does, and you and you don't have much money coming in, mm-hmm. so your budget is structured in a way. No, go go do this stuff. Yep. I, I think that's something that is, you know, in our society right now, there's way too many people that when you're not on financially stable ground that are paying for convenience, when maybe that is not what your budget mm-hmm. needs at that point. But I do think once you're saving and investing the 25% and your time is worthwhile and you're trying to make sure you're doing right by the kids, right by your spouse, by all means, take advantage of these convenience things. And I'll even give you the other side of the coin of where you can even pay a premium. Is like I, I picked on grocery delivery, mm-hmm. but meal services, you know, meaning where they show up with the, the fresh ingredients and you, and like you cook c- it meal prep services. I am willing to pay a premium on that because in some ways it also expands my quality of life because it's like date nights for my wife and I when we cook that's great. two nights a week. So that, that's why I think you do need to pay attention to your budget, where you are in your life and financial cycle so that you get that perfect recipe of the cost to benefit and knowing that there is value there, intrinsic value to your financial life. All right, Brian, so we've talked about it's okay to spend money on things that you use a lot, and it's okay to spend money on things that perhaps remove hassles or free up your time. This last category, I think, Brian, is the one that you're the most excited about, because it's the one that you get the most energy and passion we talk about it, and that is spending your money on things that truly bring you happiness. Well, this is because it lets us get back to the why. Money is a tool. We all know that. It's easy to say that, but I find that a lot of people have a lot of unhealthy relationships Mm -hmm. on what they think money will do for them for the long term. I I was listening to a podcast, and it was this pretty famous comedian on there talking, and and he was saying, and it was around the 42-minute mark, because I even wrote it down to share with you. So after the show, I'll have to show it to you. But he was like, man, I have this weird relationship. The last year was hard for me. I was more famous than I ever was, Mm -hmm. but I just got depressed because I realized this money thing that I'd been chasing my whole life 
was a lot emptier empty. than I thought. And, and that's why I think there's a lot of people out there. If you're not, if the only reason you're trying to build wealth is because you think when you have $3 million, your life and all your problems are going to be solved, you're going to find out that never addressed the why. That never addressed what actually brings you happiness, what brings you fulfillment. So if you can do the exercises of knowing exactly what does make you happy, you're going to find that the money actually kicks harder and better for you in a lot of positive ways. And for me, and I've shared this, I've always tried to bedazzle my basic life, even in the years that I was living in scarcity, to now when I have more in abundance, I like to travel. I think it is great to build memories. You guys saw, if you're on any of our social media um, platforms, my oldest daughter had graduated high school. Um, with the pandemic, we didn't get to travel like we had planned to with her to build memories before she left the house. So we asked her as a graduation gift, what do you want to do? And she immediately was like, let's go to Europe. So we went to Paris. I mean, you guys were so positive on the comments when we posted those pictures. We had the trip of a lifetime. And I think, you know, I can't imagine because I've told you guys, memories actually blossom. So mm-hmm. my trip from like the early 2000s where I went to Italy on no money practically, and we and I was dragging my suitcase down the cobblestone, getting ripped off by all the local vendors and everything. That stuff has blossomed in a positive way, even though some of that was very stressful. This trip was so plush and great that I'm, I'm curious to see how it blossoms in different ways because it just worked out so well. And I think we the whole family got some great memories. And truthfully, it's making it easier for my daughter to go off to college because I feel like we got that period to really kind of love on each other before she she kind of left the house. Yeah, and so you love building experiences, or you love using your money to utilize doing these experiences. And these are big things, right? These are like, you know, obviously a, a graduation trip to Paris is a big experience, or going to Italy was a big experience. But maybe for you, you love experiences, but maybe the thing that brings you happiness is a smaller thing. Maybe it's, it's, it's you do like the experiences, but maybe you have some creature comforts that really just bring you joy. The content team put this together, and I don't, <laughs> I don't know that I realized it per se, but uh, I like coffee. I drink it in the morning. I drink it in the afternoon. I drink in the evening. Uh, all we have a Starbucks really close to the office, so it's very easy for me to get Starbucks coffee. I have uh, two drinks. Write me if you want to know what they are. I'll tell you what they are when you come by. You can bring me one. Uh, and I so just love shameless. coffee, right? And I recognize. It may not be the most sound financial decision in the world to buy coffee. We have a really nice coffee maker here. We buy good beans, and I drink that coffee too. But every now and then, I just like this idea of a barista who has this uh, trade and craft making me a really delicious cup of coffee, and that brings me happiness, and I don't think it's going to derail my financial life. I also, you know, athleisure. It's another thing. It's sort of a little creature (laughs) comfort of mine. I like to work out, and when I'm out and about socializing, I wear workout clothes. If you ever see me out in public, odds are I'm going to be wearing workout shorts and a workout shirt just because I like to be super, super comfortable, but I don't necessarily buy the absolute least expensive stuff. I buy the stuff that I think is comfortable, that lasts a long time, and I think it looks pretty decent. And that's one of the reasons I buy it. I think it's okay for me to spend money on those things, even though I could spend less on something else. Those kinds of things bring me happiness. I, I do. This We hadn't even talked about this. I remember that back in 2008 when we worked out because you were, I'd hired you, but you were also like my personal <laughs> trainer for, for to get me through the stressful period of 2008. And I had never worked out like Real worked out, and I sh- I was so proud of myself because I showed up with these gym clothes that uh-huh. I thought were so cool. Uh-huh. But I bought them at Walmart, yep. and they didn't. But they don't say Walmart on them. <laughs> I can't even remember the brand name that was on them. But as soon as I showed up, you're like, <laughs> you went to Walmart. Like, that's Wal- yeah, that's Walmart, <laughs> and that's fine. I mean, that's not an indictment on Walmart. But once I introduced him to some of the better, uh, in my opinion, more versatile athleisure brands. It was okay, it, you know. So, that, but that was something that was bringing me happiness way before success. What you know, way back then in two thousand eight, you have to figure out what those things are for you, and decide from a budgetary standpoint: is it okay for me to spend money on them, or how much money is it okay for me to spend? Because you hear all the time, especially when there's a picture of me drinking all these Starbucks, you hear all these financial minds say, "Oh, well, you got to worry about the latte effect. You got to worry about the latte effect. You got to worry about the latte effect." We take offense to that because I don't think it is the latte effect that derails most people's financial life. I think realistically, 
it's more like the Lambo effect that gets you off kilter. Yeah, I mean, we even created an illustration of this, is that, look, if you if Bo bought a cup of coffee every day of the month, mm-hmm. it is an opportunity cost of $150 a month. Well, I know personally, Bo is investing by a multiple <laughs> of many much greater than this $150 a month. So that's that's the whole part about if you can save and invest 25% of your gross income, it should be a freeing moment to let you feel more inspired to live your best life without the guilt and the fear that you're that you're not doing what you need to for yourself. But you can see how the latte effect at $150 mm-hmm. a month, you compare that to, and look, we went the extreme with this. We did throw the Lamborghini out mm-hmm. there. If you had to finance a $200,000 vehicle, even Following with the 238 even but I'd argue it's a luxury car, so it's a little bit of a flaw. Yeah, I mean, flaw. that is a little bit flawed in the fact that you'd have to pay cash on this. But you can see, even if we allowed you, we did this for illustration and educational purposes, it would still cost you $4,600 mm-hmm. a month. Investing $4,600 a month is going to build financial independence in a very rapid fashion. Lay that next to the $150 a month, and you can see... There's just a a stark difference in that opportunity cost. Brian, you said it best. Uh, We know money is a tool. It is something that we can use to allow us to focus on those things in this life that truly matter, both in the future and now. And while we think that one of the superpowers of financial mutants is deferred gratification, there's also a realization you have to have of when is it okay for me to spend money? What what are the things it's okay for me to spend money on? Because frankly, none of us are promised tomorrow. And the last thing that you want to do is save up all this wealth and save up all these resources and do all this sacrifice and then get there and that unknown, unknown Tuesday evening thing comes along and you're like, holy cow, what did I miss out on? Well, and it's also the perfect closing on this is to give you some homework, Mm -hmm. is to say, hey, I want you to do an exercise because both... Bo and I have been very confessional on this, is that I love travel. Mm -hmm. I love doing things like that with my family. He just shared it's a littler thing with like coffee Mm -hmm. expenses. What is the thing that actually brings you happiness? Because maybe the goal for you and the homework after watching this content is is to actually sit down and ask yourself that question. Because maybe you've never actually gone the depth of figuring out what are the little things that bring me happiness? What are the big things that bring me happiness? Am I on the journey to this money actually creating fulfillment? Meaning that when I wake up in the morning, I feel like I'm making the world a little bit better and I have purpose. And if you can do that homework and that exercise, I think you'll have much more clarity on the why that you should spend or invest every dollar that comes into your custody and that's the that's all we can ask for. Mm-hmm. Truthfully, at the end of the day, creating a plan, but also making sure you are do, put, building into that plan a good, efficient use and understanding of what you tick with on, on, from a money standpoint is going to create a lot of happiness, a lot of fulfillment. And I think you might just be shocked. It's going to bring a lot of abundance and wealth in the long term, too. But don't worry. If you want to know more about how to save your money and what to do with your money and where to put your money and how to protect your money, we are going to keep loading you up. If you've not gone to the website, go to moneyguide.com. We have a whole resource page with a plethora of resource that you can use right now today to help take your finances to the next level. Guys, I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen. Till next time, Money Got Team.